Thank you. I, uh, I wasn't nervous, but I am now. So. <laughs> okay, good. So uh, the representations of childhood visual impairment. And that representations uh, is with an S in brackets because really what I'm going to talk about is how we perceive children with a visual impairment. But I'm also going to talk a little bit about how children with visual impairment represent the world as well. So there's two types of representations that I'm going to talk about. So when I was growing up in the 1970s, and in fact I saw this the other day as I went to Bath, uh, uh, interestingly enough, uh, some images of how uh, children with visual impairment are represented. And, and here's uh, three typical images here, and here's a child there uh, in blue shorts, uh, with his hand, I guess, uh, uh, on a book, and I presume he's actually reading Braille, or that's meant to be reading Braille, uh, and then there's Sooty, Sooty saying, please help blind people. So these are the representations that I've grown up with, that we've become accustomed to of childhood uh, uh, visual impairment. And really, this is so far from the truth. This is not at all of how we should perceive children with a visual impairment. So, but I think it's uh, customary in inaugurals, before we start getting into the main content of the talk, is to do a bunch of thank yous. Obviously, I want to thank my parents, uh, and obviously Elaine and Ewan, uh, for all those late nights, all the travelling that I do, uh, and putting up with all the work at home every Sunday, well, as all of us academics do. But particularly, I'd like to pay thank you to that. And of course, I want to thank those monkeys. I want to thank Chico and Toto, uh, Ben, what's the other name of the monkey, uh, uh, the Cebus Apala, and that's where I did my uh, PhD, the ontology of inductive systems. And my supervisor there has already been mentioned, uh, not only was my supervisor, but really was a very, very good friend of mine, and uh, as a uh, Maggie will know, uh, uh, it was Brendan McGonagall uh, and uh, our thoughts to Brendan. Uh, whilst I was at Burbeck, I really got introduced for the very, very first time uh, philosophy. Uh, and my philosophy tutor there was someone called Martin Davis, who went over to uh, University of Oxford there. And he persevered and worked with me for years and years. It was a two-year degree trying to get me to understand the work of Donald Davidson. And it's Donald Davidson, I think, has had the biggest influence uh, on my career at all. And I urge you all to read a particular paper called Rational Animals. It's only 10 pages. Uh, uh, and that, for me, is a paper I still read. I still read monthly. And it's a hugely important paper. In order to understand Davidson, you should read Rational Animals. So a bunch of people that have really guided my philosophical thinking, thank you very much. But it's also is that combination with visual impairment that I've been working with. As already noted, I cannot thank enough the support, the help, the mentorship, the friendship by Professor Gordon Dutton. Thank you very much, Gordon. Um, also, more recently, uh, I've been working very closely with colleagues in America, uh, um, Professor Amanda Lewick, who's been helping me to really start to understand, to work together regarding assessment of children with visual impairment. Mariana, who gave me my very first job uh, in visual impairment all those years and years ago. And all this time, there's been a constant thorn in my side, and that's my very good friend, uh, Dr. Andrew Blakey. And I'd like to thank Andrew very much for his help and support as well. Okay, that's the thank yous done. So what is this talk about? Well, really, I think my talk is going to be about how... Uh, uh, I've been focusing on trying to change the lives of children with visual impairment and any other disabilities. But the main thing I really want you to walk away with, the main thing I really want you to remember and focus is to get you to think differently about childhood visual impairment from when you walked in. That's the, my main objective. That's my one single aim. My one single objective of this talk is for you to think differently about childhood vision impairment than perhaps when you came in. So I'm going to talk something about cerebral vision impairment, which is what I'm particularly interested in. I'm going to talk a little bit about some work we did, uh, and it's nice to see the Visual Impairment Scotland team here. And I'm going to talk a little bit about VINCIP, 
and I'm going to talk a little bit about cerebral visual impairment and the theory of mind. So, when putting up a talk for inaugural, it's kind of one of these weird things. And I think the best advice was given to me by uh, Graham Douglas uh, from Birmingham. And Graham said to me, when you're doing your inaugural, try, the aim of it is to try to explain, particularly to your family, what it is you do when you turn up to work. What is it that you actually do from nine to five for 20 years at the university? What is it you actually do? So there are some things that had to come in and some things that I'm, that I'm going to focus on. One of these things, though, is really about impact that I've been working on. On one of the projects that I did uh, was with Professor John Davis and Stephen Farrier, just there, is to call the Fiesta Project. And this project really focused on trying to identify the best practice for children with a complex additional support needs, transitioning from special school into mainstream environments. And this research project was an eight European country research project, and it really identified 10 particular factors around child-led transition. And the photograph is of a conference in Barcelona that John and I and Stephen presented at, and at the end, parents were really coming up to us at the end, thanking us for identifying these factors and making the transition much smoother for these children. But I'm not going to focus on that. Nor am I going to focus on a study that I worked with Wendy Timmins, who's just sitting there. And Wendy and I uh, wanted to work with Sophia Lycris from the College of Art, and we wanted to investigate whether, in fact, people uh, with blindness could actually have kinesthetic empathy as sighted audiences do when they go and watch blind performances. So you're watching a blind audience, a, 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 a dance audience, and you're watching a dancer, and you get that kinesthetic experience, you get that, that empathy with the dancer. Could we envisage that same kind of representation, that same kind of kinesthetic empathy using a cross-modal transfer by using a haptic pad? And so we did uh, a whole series of experiments with uh, teenagers, with uh, uh, adults who are blind, with school children at the Royal Blind School. And we were able for the very, very first time to demonstrate as a proof of concept that in fact we were able to demonstrate that kinesthetic experience. Very first time able. But I'm not going to talk about that either. Nor am I going to talk about a project that I did just fairly recently called Movis. And Movis was a, uh, an app specifically designed for blind people, for people who are blind. And this isn't an app that's accessible. This is a very, very different project. An accessible app is just an app that is accessible. But this is an app specifically designed for people who are blind wanting to learn a language. And what was really interesting about this is that when you layer an app that is specifically for people who are blind on, on top of Apple's accessibility functions, it makes the app inaccessible. So there are these two interesting uh, features of Apple's accessibility and access for people who are blind that make it incompatible. And it took us about eight months to resolve the issue with Apple. I'm not going to talk about that either. Nor I'm really going to talk about my uh, particular interests in research methods. Now, I've been lucky enough to be really involved in a couple of priority settings. I've worked uh, uh, down in with London, and more recently with the James Lind Alliance, uh, uh, looking at how to set priority settings within the field within visual impairment. But I've also uh, very recently done a little bit of work with my uh, colleague, Kerry Wasney uh, at Chinri, which is another type of research priority setting. And here are a couple of papers that we're just going to publish very soon in the Journal of Global Health. And of course, I have a particular interest in research methodologies. And this is my uh, uh, very recent 2018 Building Research Design in Education edited book with Lorna Hamilton, available at all good bookshops now. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about that either. 
Because actually, as you know, my chair is in childhood vision impairment. So I think it's only fitting I should really talk about childhood vision impairment. So let's have a look. Vision. So it's quite clearly we use vision to access information. We use it to access information that's a long way. And we use the vision to access information that's near to us when we read and we look at uh, 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 our phones and so forth. But also we use uh, a vision to help us guide our movements, particularly through our upper limbs, to reach, to walk, to navigate around the environment without bumping into it. So I'm very good at being able to do that. I'm very good at being able to use my vision to navigate through 3D space. And that's very important to me. I'm also very good to able to use my vision and coordinate my body movement so I can pick up my glass quite comfortably and quite easily. I'm also very good to use my vision to look around the room to see who's already lost and who's already bored and who's not beginning to lose interest. As I look at my son. <laughs> I can see someone in the, I can see the group. I can recognize faces. I know very, a lot of many people here, but there are some faces I don't know at all. And I can, again, see the language within that facial expression. So all this, I'm just using my vision to do that automatically very easily. And all of this, of course, has a huge, huge implications for learning. And this is what we do, and this is what we focus in our courses at the university here and within the uh, Scottish Sensory Centre. But let's be really clear what exactly vision really is. And vision, as we know, must involve more than the eyes, okay? And this is something I really want you to remember. So, so eye, the optic nerve, and the brain. The brain is the bit that I particularly want to focus on, okay? So eyes, the eyes are interesting, uh, are necessary, uh, and we've got the optic nerve, and then we've got the brain. And if you remember uh, back to our monkeys, this is a particular interesting wiring diagram of the primate visual pathways. So we've known how the visual pathways, how the visual processes have worked for quite a while. Uh, and whilst we can't quite complete it just yet for humans, we've had a pretty good understanding since 1991. So, higher biology, if you remember your higher biology, this is, uh, you get information from your eyes, whether it's your left visual field or your right visual field. It comes along, it goes and crosses over at the optic chiasm there, and it goes back to your occipital cortex, your primary visual uh, cortex, right at the back of the brain there. Shoots along there, the information that gets sent along to that. And that's basically where your higher biology ended. But actually what happens from the visual cortex is that the information is then gets dispersed into two main areas. There are actually three, but two main areas. And these two areas, one area is called the temporal lobe, which is around here, and the other information gets dispersed into the posterior parietal lobe, which is around here. Okay, and these two signals interact. They've been described as a, a, as a, a, a stream, uh, but I like to call them sometimes as a network because they coordinate with each other as well. And this part is really the dorsal and the ventral stream. So that when the information goes along to the temporal lobes, this is what's called the ventral stream. So this is particularly what I am interested in, ventral stream and dorsal stream. Now the ventral stream along here it goes along to what's called our visual knowledge, our library. It's where our information is stored. It's where I'm able to look around, I'm able to see Professor Davis, I'm able to see James, Stelios, I'm able to recognize the faces, I'm able to recognize who's engaged, who's not engaged. I'm using that information from my ventral stream. This is what I'm doing, this is what I'm doing. And I'm able to recognize shapes, I'm able to recognize the roots, I'm able to remember how to go to the toilet and where exactly the next glass of wine will be upstairs. So all of these roots are stored in this visual knowledge area that's coordinated through the ventral stream. Up to the top of the dorsal stream, of the parietal lobe here, 
is where it helps me. It's an unconscious process, and this is where our map and guidance system sits. This is where I'm, I'm able to walk around the room and not bump into things and not crash into the uh, interpreter here. And this is my very fast, very unconscious system that has enabled me to, uh, to do this. It also enables me to very quickly reach out and grab cups without knocking them down. I'm able to do this unconsciously very, very, very quickly as well. However, if you have damage to any of those systems, damage to any of those processes, any of that, this is what we call cerebral vision impairment. So what I focus on is something called cerebral vision impairment. And cerebral vision impairment is what we describe as an umbrella term that describes a deficiency in the functions of vision, functions of vision due to damage or malfunction of the pathways and of the visual centers of the brain. So there's not one unified definition of CVI, if you look it up, but this is the definition that I quite like to use and I've used in my classes. Uh, the latter bit is for the ophthalmologists just sitting here. Good. So a little bit more detail about the ventral pathway. So the ventral pathway, as I said, goes along the temporal lobe and helps us to represent and identify objects, whether there's a sphere or whether there's a cube going on to the puzzle that is at the beginning of the flyer. It helps us to recognize shape and color. And again, it stores that visual memory for me and allows me to make visual comparisons. Again, it requires that, that conscious processing. So, first of all, I want you to tell me who this is. <laughs> okay, James Bond, exactly. So this is clearly me. So you're using your ventral stream there, and you go, hey, that's John. And I want you to tell me exactly, is John happy or sad or angry? Or So what emotion is John? Thank you. <laughs> so John is happy. John is... John is Wait till you see the next one, okay? So John is sad. This is angry. This is angry. I should just ask my son this. And John is, John is surprised. Good, good, good. So clearly, all of you have very good uh, ventral stream processing. You're able to do that. But if you have damage to your ventral stream processing, right, you're not able to recognize those emotions. You're not able to recognize that I'm happy, that I'm sad, that I'm angry. Okay, you're unable to develop that. You're unable to process that information. And in fact, Elizabeth regularly tells me she works with a student who every time you show teeth, as in the happy example, that student thinks he's being told off. That student thinks Elizabeth is angry. So Elizabeth has to work very hard at not showing her teeth or smiling, rewarding that child. Because that child cannot process that information. And this is called cerebral visual impairment. So cerebral visual impairment, and in particular, ventral pathway deficits. We have poor facial recognition. And we have children who mistake strangers as someone who's known to them. Imagine the child coming out of the, out of the nursery playground and just going up to strangers, thinking that they're mom or dad. They are unable to recognize who, their own parents. Poor recognition of facial expressions. Poor visual memory, difficulty remembering where objects are. And difficulty remembering where the belongings are left. Difficulty in remembering where familiar people based on the clues and naming colors. Going over to the dorsal stream now, from the occipital cortex to the parietal lobe, the, the um, dorsal streams helps us to filter out information uh, and gives us an ability to selectively attune and attend to information in a complex scene. So I'm able to look around the room and stop and particularly focus on individual people, such as Simon Beams there. So I'm able to do that. It's my dorsal stream that's helping me to do that. 
And so here we have a typical complex scene, although we don't see supermarkets quite like this because the security is perfect in all areas. But you know at the front of this photograph, we've got some citrus fruits, we've got some lemons, we've got some oranges and limes, I think. Further over back, we've got some apples, I think, some red apples, some green apples, perhaps, maybe tomatoes after that, maybe some peppers. If you look at the far left, there's a bakery, and there's some uh, refrigerator units at the back. So all of our dorsal stream is able to select and take out and filter information. Okay, is, is able to do that. That's our dorsal stream being able to do that. Imagine, though, you can't do that. Imagine a world where you're unable to filter out that information. And there are many people with cerebral vision impairment who have that. And that's called simultaneous agnosia. And these are slides from a good uh, colleague of mine from New Zealand called Nicola. And she's allowed me to demonstrate this because it's really important to get this across. So we have a, a, a scene here on the left, Nicola going to a concert. But the information that she sees is so much, it overloads a visual system, the dorsal stream system, and it collapses right down. And so in these environments, Nicola is only able to focus on that chap with a hat. And, and it's not able that she's able to just move around and then complete a whole picture. She's not able to do that. Similarly with the man and the, two, the man with the balloons here, that visual information, that visual scene is too much. And the system doesn't allow her to visually inspect and, and put the information together. And so she only can focus on that. So this is cerebral visual impairment. This is simultaneous agnosia. And many, many, many children with cerebral visual impairment have simultaneous agnosia. And many, many, many children are in mainstream schools. So what are we doing in our mainstream schools, and particularly in our mainstream environments, where we're overloading the information there? The information that are on the walls, the information that... Dang I've gone into a primary school recently, and there was a washing line. A washing line dangling down, uh, at least six washing lines with all the students, all the pupils work on it. And I'm there to see a child with visual impairment with simultaneous agnosia. Are we setting that child up in a, in a fantastic learning environment, or are we setting that child up to fail? How can that be an optimal learning environment? Similarly, when a child goes out into the playground, difficulty in recognizing friends, difficulty in recognizing facial emotions, difficulty in supporting that child. So the work that we do at the university, Elizabeth and I and all of my colleagues here, we have to really try and get to understand our mainstream teachers that classrooms like this it's not our optimal learning environment for children with cerebral visual impairment. And the majority of children with CVI are in mainstream schools. So, acuity then. Acuity is no longer the single marker for childhood vision impairment. And acuity is that when you go to the optometrist test and you're sitting there and you're reading off the chart and how clear you see and how well you see, it's no longer that single marker. It's absolutely important, but it's singular marker. Because what we find is we get sort of three groups of children with cerebral visual impairment. So children with profound CVI. So these are our complex need children, those children with uh, uh, multiple disabilities, have really profound visual impairment in CVI. We have children who have sort of good functional vision, okay vision, it's not good acuity at all, and some cognitive challenges due to CVI. And we have people who have really excellent vision, but still have CVI. And it's the skill that we have to uh, bestow upon our QTVIs and upon ourselves as ophthalmologists, as pediatricians, is to assess all of these categories and to assess all of these children. So, why does any of this matter? Why does knowing about CVI matter? Well, it's clearly important to understand in any learning environment 
How do children with, P with CVI perceive their experience in the world? Okay. These children perceive their environment as what's normal to them. They don't see themselves as having a, a deficit in vision or something's odd with their vision or something strange with their vision. They see the world as what's normal to them. And it's really important, and we must not and should not transpose our visual experiences onto the child, which is more and often not what we see in the classroom. We have to understand, and this is the mark of the QTVI, of an excellent classroom teacher, we have to understand what is for each and every individual child, what information is accessible, what information is perceivable, what information is understandable, what motivates, and what's meaningful for every single child. And this is a hugely important factor when we are educating children with cerebral visual impairment. And why does this matter? This matters because cerebral visual impairment is the most common form of childhood visual impairment there is in economically developing countries and rapidly increasing in economically developing countries as well. So in the UK, in Scotland, in Europe, in America, in Australia, Japan, CVI is the most common form of childhood visual impairment there is. Absolutely. So, okay, John, I've got the whole thing about CVI now. Well, just exactly how many kids with CVI are there? Well, unfortunately, whilst we know through incidence and prevalence data it's the most common form, we actually don't know. We really do not know how many children with CVI there are. We don't know in Scotland, we don't know in the UK, uh, and I would guess we really don't know anywhere. There are multiple data sets. We have the education data sets. We've got NHS data sets. We have welfare data sets. We've got uh, census data sets. But there are often poorly in applied inclusion criteria, and they're not linked up. They're not stored electronically. We still have some paper files, and sometimes they're just not updated. So we really do not know exactly how many children with CVI there are in Scotland. It's not in the International Classification of Disease 10. And a group of us, including myself, have been working very hard to try and make it explicit in the International Classification of Disease 11. Uh, and in some draft versions, it's there, and in some other versions, it's not there. So it's not explicit either. It's just not explicit either. So let's have a look at what data we do have. So every year, the Scottish government uh, uh, publishes uh, how many children there are with visual impairment uh, uh, in Scottish schools. And according to the Scottish Government, there are 4,331 children with visual impairment in Scotland, making that a ratio of something like 6.3 per thousand pupils. Okay? However, <laughs> however, this is just not the case. Okay? Now, it might well be, but we don't know. Uh, this data is collected for those who know by the CMUS uh, 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 data set which uh, has a very poor inclusion criteria. Uh, we can't verify anyone on that data set that actually has having a vision impairment, so we don't actually know. When you do an audit of NHS data, we certainly don't see 4,331 children. And when we do an audit of the VI teaching service, which we do quite regularly, we don't see that data at all. So the Scottish government is working off some data that we believe amongst in the field is just wrong. It's purely, simply wrong. So in order to try and rectify this, in order to try and understand really how many children with VI in Scotland, we set up a project, and like I say, the team are here at the front, to develop a project called Vision Impairment Scotland. And this is where parents notified to us that they had a child with visual impairment, but they could only enter onto our data set if that child was verified by a, either a paediatrician or by a paediatric ophthalmologist. 
So we knew for a fact that these children that entered onto the VIS data set were in fact visually impaired. They weren't in fact maybe, oh yes, we'll enter on the CMOS data that Johnny wears glasses, so he must be visually impaired. These are children who are verified as having a significant visual impairment uh, by the paediatrician or by the paediatric ophthalmologist. And over a period of time, we built up 1,085 children notified. It's one of the largest data sets of childhood visual impairment there is. This is a, a significant large data set, and it's held at the Scottish Sensory Centre upstairs. So having that data set, I am able to map exactly where every child on that VIS data set is. And the purple dot represents children with a visual impairment. The bigger the dot, the more children there are in that area. So I can start to look at exactly where do children with visual impairment fall within Scotland. And as you can see, not too unsurprisingly, that they fall within the majority of the population live within that central belt area as well. But I can do that by, uh, in this case, I've done this by health board, I can do this by local authority, and I can do this by the regional improvement collaboratives as well. So we can start to really think about just exactly how many children there are with a visual impairment within Scotland, within whatever system and institution we need to start to look at. I can do this by any type of condition, primary condition. This is those that are affected by the lens, an optical condition there. There are 39 uh, 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 people, and I can map that. So any primary diagnosis, we are able to map where these children are, and start to think about the support, the education that we can put children together with. Looking at the top 10 primary diagnoses in Scotland then, and it's absolutely staggering, this, this graph, I think, CVI is the most common form of childhood vision impairment there is in Scotland. 323 children out of the 1,000 data sets 55% of all children on the 1,000 data sets have cerebral visual impairment. The next category, the next primary diagnosis, which is con congenital nystagmus, 8%. That gap is huge. Childhood visual impairment, cerebral visual impairment. And so, of course, I can start to map exactly where all the children with cerebral vision impairment are. I can start to look at how these children are being supported, which local authorities are supporting them, and how they're being uh, 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 assessed with this large data set. And knowing where the children are, having a map, having all of these children's postcodes, I know exactly where every child is, gives me access to SIMD, because I can do that, uh, and SIMD is the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation. And this identifies small concentrations of de deprivation across Scotland in a very consistent way. So, childhood and vision impairment as a whole and SIMD. Now, to get a, a, a feel for those who don't know SIMD, category one, I use decile, so I use 10 equal categories of SIMD. You can use five uh, or you can use ten. I prefer to use ten. So up to ten, one is the most deprived areas. 20% of the population live, has been put into that category and ten is the most. And it's quite interesting uh, if you know your postcode, which you do, you can enter your own postcode into the SIMD index and you can see which one of these ten categories you live in. Uh, I live in a farming area, and then I actually live quite low down in that category. So uh, it's quite interesting. So SIMD and visual impairment as a whole, this is the kind of graph we see. And if we do some uh, 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 statistics on this, what we find is that uh, there's really no correlation between uh, social deprivation and uh, uh, visual impairment. You do find this in other uh, additional support need categories, but in visual impairment, we seem to not get this. It's not statistically significant. There's no correlation at all. And in fact, if you take out cerebral visual impairment from that particular group, the correlation is 0.2. 
And so it becomes an even weaker correlation. And so it really seems to suggest that there is some research that does suggest there is a VI correlation that just isn't at all. So CVI then, because I can map where every child with cerebral vision impairment is, I can also map uh, their uh, SIMD 1 to 10 category. And so their graph looks slightly different for children with CVI. And so 1 to 10, 10 is the most deprived, uh, least deprived is the 10. And if we start doing uh, some statistics on this, in fact, what we tend to find is that there is a very strong relationship between CVI and social deprivation, a row of 0.8. So CVI seems to find, is found more in the most deprived areas of Scotland based on these equal percentiles. Childhood vision impairment as a whole, the occurrence of CVI is statistically correlated to deprivation. You're going to find more children with CVI in these less well-off areas of Scotland, particularly in the very poorest, most deprived areas of Scotland from the first four categories. So if I was in charge of public health, I would specifically focus from one to four those areas there. But there's a note of warning. Just remember, all you students who are in this room, that correlation doesn't equal causation. Okay. So what are the possible causes? What are the possible causes of finding CVI in the most deprived areas, more likely to be found in the more deprived areas in Scotland? Well, there could be an argument towards downward migration. So downward migration is, uh, I have a child with complex additional support needs, very expensive to support, so I might need to sell my nice house and buy a, a, a cheaper house. I might need to sell my car and actually live in the center of somewhere where I could just get a bus. So you've got this general downward migration. I'm pretty sure that accounts for two or three, maybe more cases, who knows. But I don't think that really accounts for the real uh, uh, finding. I think we need to start looking at, and this is what we're going to be doing later on in a project that I'll talk about uh, later, is start to think about the maternal health, the maternal mental health, the diet, the smoking, the drugs, look at prematurity, look at the low birth weight, and there's even an argument around epigenetics, the environment affecting the genes of the child as well. So we have to start to really think about the possible causes of trying to find why CVI is found in these poor areas. This is a, this is a new founding, finding, not been found at all anywhere before. So successful was the project Vision Impairment Scotland that it's now been taken over, I'm really pleased to see, uh, by, uh, and James is here representing VINSIP, uh, by uh, uh, the NHS Scotland as a managed clinical network called uh, VINSIP. Uh, and VINSIP became the winner, or sorry, became second in the category we should have won of the best patient support uh, in 2015. And this is, uh, there's Lynn. There's Lynn, yep, yeah, there's Lynn, uh, myself, and Kathy Spowett, a uh, paediatrician, collecting the award of VINSIP based on the VIS profile. I've also, uh, uh, Rowena mentioned it, I, I went to Australia, and the reason why I went to Australia was to set up that similar system in Australia. And the fields they have in Australia are exactly the fields that we have in Scotland, so we're able to coordinate and look to see if there are any differences as well. So we are able to coordinate across the world and share our data because I've set up exactly the same fields. And I'm looking at now, the reason why I'm traveling a lot to America, those who know, is because I'm doing, trying to do exactly the same in some of the states in America. So I've got a thousand children on my data set. And I've got an enormous amount of data and an enormous amount of research that I could do with. So I'm thinking for my inaugural, oh, what could I show you? So I thought what I'll do is I'll show you something quite nice and something quite different. So in order to persuade parents to come and notify their children to our data set, 
we set up a children's club called Viz Kids. And do you all remember this now? Yeah, yeah. And part of that Viz Kids, we had a chat room. Now, you've got to remember this is before Facebook. This is before uh, MySpace or whatever it was. This is quite revolutionary. So what I set up was the world's, or well, Scotland's certainly, first ever safe and secure chat room for visually impaired children. So this is children chatting to each other on the chat room, okay? And they're not chatting to just anyone out, out in the open world. They were known by me. Every person who was on that chat room was known by me and had been verified by either a pediatrician or an ophthalmologist. And this was true for children across the world. So the chat room was where you could talk and have a blether about Robbie. You can tell this is quite old. Robbie, Elvis, Rangers, Newcastle, and there are all sorts of rooms. So we had 155 children who signed up to uh, the chat room, and they came from Scotland, they came from Europe, and they came from Australia. The security on it was immense. Right? It was just it was a nightmare. And all the participants knew, all the children knew, that all of their logs, all of their chat was being recorded. And they knew that I was going to, as a research project, look at all of their logs. Because I wanted to know, what do teenage visually impaired children chat about? Okay. What is it that do they chat about? Is there a deficit model that's going on? Do they talk about their disability? Do they talk about what's it like to be visually impaired? Or do they talk about other things? So all the chat was identified uh, and logged for over 13 months. The ethics on this was enormous, by the way. Uh, uh, and the themes were then identified and reported. So children talked about, sure, a little bit about disability. Sure, the children talked about education, about physical activity and leisure, but teenage boys and teenage girls talk about teenage boys and teenage girls, no matter if you're visually impaired or not. That's quite nice. I like the fact they're just boys and they're just girls. So successful was that chat room. So successful did we be able to put that together that we, unbeknown to us, were entered into uh, a huge computing industry award. Okay, And the award was recognized by those who've done most to alleviate disability. Uh, and the judges paid particular attention to innovation and evidence. So we, so we won this massive award, beating Microsoft, beating Yahoo. And I couldn't get it, and my good friend Andrew went down to collect the award there. So it was a real, real achievement, putting these uh, uh, groups of visually impaired children across the world together for the very first time in a safe and secure environment. So, school vision screening service. So with other colleagues, and you notice that I work very collaboratively with a range of colleagues, and this is what I aim to do. So with Lorraine Murray and Jennifer Skillen, we invested screening. We, we investigated the primary seven screening program. So at the time, the Scottish government invested a lot of money in school vision screening for children aged 11. And we really wanted to know, is this a worthwhile program? Is it worthwhile screening every 11-year-old in Scottish schools? Intuitively, you think, that's a good thing. Let's do this. Let's continue to do this. But funds were finite. Were finite, And we really wanted to know really exactly how many children were falling through the gaps. How many children had a previously undetected significant visual impairment around 11. So we analysed 18,000 records, 18,626 to be precise. And we interviewed all the parents and children who had failed the school vision screening service. And we found, interestingly enough, less than 1%, which was in line with what other research had told us. And as an impact on policy, the Scottish government has now stopped, and this is generally my fault, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, in, the vision screening at age 11. I know some authorities still do a little bit of myopia screening that goes on, but the investment of that has gone help towards the, um, uh, the free eye care that we have with any of us can attend. So, 
We're coming to the end now. The wine is getting nearer. Okay. So, currently I'm really interested in looking at children with cerebral visual impairment and uh, having a deficit theory of mind. Do children with CVI have a deficit theory of mind? And theory of mind, it, it helps us to understand, internally represent other people's knowledge. So I can, I can, it helps us to, to predict behavior, to have knowledge about other people's beliefs, their emotions, and their intentions. It's a theory that's really important to help understand and navigate these social situations. And I've been really focusing on this for the last year or so. Theory of mind can help us to relate to others, if I, know what, if I know what your beliefs are, if I know, sort of know what you're thinking, I can be empathetic towards you. I'm likely to predict your behavior. I can understand your intentions and correct, perhaps, your misunderstandings. Although more interestingly for me, I'm quite interested in theory of mind because it helps us to mislead people. It helps us to deceive people, to exclude others. And theory of mind particularly helps us to manipulate people. So I'm just wondering, does theory of mind is there a deficit of theory of mind in children with CVR? So it's been argued, and it's been argued for years, that theory of mind, that children that had a ocular impairment, and this is impairment only due to their eyes, not to the brain, but just due to uh, issues with their eyes, an ocular impairment, that children with VI were delayed in acquiring a theory of mind. So it's been argued for years, right? And Primarily because they don't get to see the social interactions. They're not learned about others' mental states. They can't judge the gap between experience and verbal interaction. So it's been argued for years that this was the case, that children, ooh, look at that, that children uh, don't have, just got us all, take a look, I don't think so. But I got sent this uh, from my colleague uh, uh, at Harvard Medical School, Karina, uh, and I really want you to start looking at this. So head A, we'll do heads. Head A is a scan. Uh, and this is just a sighted person lying in the scanner. They're not doing any tasks. They're just lying there. And quite clearly, you can remember the dorsal stream and the ventral stream are, are picking up in the scans there. Okay? That's a typical, normal, sighted, typical control just lying in the scanner. So that's, that's head A. Head B is an ocular blind person, someone who has levers. And you can clearly see there's not really that much difference between the ventral and dorsal streams between person A and person B. And I started got thinking about that. Really? Is that the case? OK. So the visual processing system is firing, looks very similar to those and this person, Alibis, is completely blind. Their visual processes are firing almost identical as a sighted person. If I look at head C, clearly someone with PVL, a CVI condition, we have someone there that has a real damage to the dorsal stream. There is really little firing going on in that dorsal stream. And head D, both the ventral and the dorsal streams are deficit firing state. So it just occurs, it just makes me think, this is what I do in my office, this is what I do when I come to work. I sometimes I just stop and I just think. I mean, you all need time to think. And now I'm a professor, I'm allowed to think, so that's quite good. It just makes me think, is that the case? Should children who are ocular blind, do they really have a deficit theory of mind? Just that's proof, of, proof of concept there. And so I went hunting. So I went searching in the literature. And whilst it's quite difficult to find, it is there. There is quite a bit of research that out there. And it just seems to be the case that actually using new techniques, using new methods to look at theory of mind with children who are blind, it's the case that children, that blindness does not affect theory of mind nor the development of it in children. Okay? No differences were found with sighted and their first order, uh, a higher order theory of mind use. And part of this could be accounted for for something that's called supramodality. And this is really uh, quite an interesting uh, finding and something that I'm becoming really more interested about. 
basically what it means is that you don't need vision for the vision pathways of the brain to work. You don't need your eyes for the visual pathways of your brain to work. Okay? The, uh, cortical, the cortical architecture and function of the brain occurs, will function, will generate, uh, in the absence of any visual experience. Okay? You don't need your vision, you don't need your eyes for your pathways of the brain to work. And this seems to me then account for why children who are ocular blind have a theory of mind. The supermodality is working well. So children with CVI, as we've already discovered today, have a range of visual acuity deficits, contrast sensitivity deficits, visual field deficits, simultaneous agnosia, prosopagnosia, intricative agnosia, dyskinetopsia, and optic ataxia. You medics really need to get like, <laughs> easier words, okay? And all of this can preclude visual elements of the scene, okay? Both the required to learn and ex exhibit a theory of mind. And research tells us quite a lot. And in green, green is the stuff that helps you to develop a theory of mind. So children born preterm, premature children, we know, and 50% of all children with CVI are born preterm. So children born preterm are at risk of disordered temporal processing. And that then helps us whether it's the perception or the interpretation of these rapid changes of facial expressions can contribute to or not help to contribute to the acquisition of a theory of mind. Children with CVI have poor ability to match one's movements to the visual scene, to what's going on around us, to the environment that we're in, to follow move or to recognize their movements and to really process that rapid sequence of change. All of this is needed to develop a theory of mind. Clearly that children with CVI don't have this. So, what I've been doing in my journeys to America is not been going out partying or <laughs> drinking or anything like that, is working with my colleagues, again at Harvard Medical School, to set up and write the grant, because this is quite expensive stuff, uh, to do the first ever study on CVI using these new imaging techniques to investigate prosopagnosia, the face blindness, determine if children with CVI, A, differ to children with uh, 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 autistic spectrum disorder, and first to investigate the default mode network. So when your brain is at rest, there's what's a new theory called the default mode network, when your brain is just firing. And this firing, it's been told, the default mode network, is really a contributor to developing a theory of mind. So do children with CVI have the default mode network firings? Don't know. We don't know. So this is what we're developing a grant now with uh, Harvard Medical School and the school here within Edinburgh as well. And we want to do this really because we want to, if, if this is the case and we don't know, we could be completely barking up the wrong tree because we really want to develop targets for habilitation strategies, for orientation and mobility teachers, for education strategies, for help to improve recognizing features for individuals and trying to get children to understand these facial emotions and expressions to help them in their learning environment. Ultimately, what we want to do is to improve the quality of life for children with CVI. So Sooty, remember Sooty? All that long time ago. So instead really of those two uh, uh, images of those children with the, red, with the little shorts and the red book feeling uh, 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 the braille, Actually, sooty is probably a greater representation of childhood visual impairment because I'm looking straight into his brain. <laughs> and so perhaps we should thank sooty for CVI. I don't know. So finally, the question that's been posed upon my poster. So now you've had time to think about it. Now you've had time to 
to consider it. And this is a really old, more than 400 year old philosophical problem. I know that Robbie has been wrestling with this. Uh, and so, a man being born blind, having a globe and a cube, an eye of the same bigness, committed to his hand and being taught which is the globe and which is the cube. And then he has his sight restored. Let's suppose, before he touched them, would he knew they are a globe and would he knew which one is the cube? Okay, so this is the social interaction time. Hands up if you think yes. Come on, hands up. Hands up if you think no. Okay, good. Yeah, so the clue there is the instant. <laughs> yeah. So uh, my answer is this. I will look at Gordon. <laughs> so my answer is, is this. Uh, if the sight is restored instantly, the, the person is not going to be able to recognize it. Okay, you need, you need training of the visual pathways for it to occur. Okay, so uh, we've got a lot of research coming from India. Now, uh, but how long is that training? We're not so sure. It could be as little as two hours, or it could be days or weeks. We don't know. But the answer, if it was instant, the answer is no. So my answer, Robbie, is yes, but with training. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. And thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, John. John has kindly said that a couple of questions. I think he wants to get to the wine. But he would like to give you the opportunity to ask questions. So if you have a question, please, I'm sure John would be more than happy to engage in conversation. So, any questions or comments, actually, you might want to add to the conversation and lecture. <laughs> yes, Evelyn. Yeah. Hi, John. Um, I, I saw the research on theory of mind. I, I know that um, hearing impaired children, if, the, if their parents are not hearing impaired, they're not supposed to sign language until they're about two, then they're quite delayed in developing the theory of mind. And I thought that vision impaired children were also, but obviously for a different reason, because they can't see. So, but you, so, so I wasn't quite clear. Are you saying that they, they can see with, with, with that impairment because they do have some? So, so what, I, what I'm saying is that because of the supermodality, children with ocular impairment don't seem to be uh, or have a hindrance of having a theory of mind. So okay. whatever it is that they have the capacity for, as opposed to a completely visually impaired child, then they are able to develop that kind of connection. So, this, so, this, so, so if your supermodality is all working, you, you, but you have no vision... That shouldn't stop you from developing. You were showing us they had some vision. Uh, those, are the, those are the CVI children, oh, not the ocular, oh, ocular right. blind children. So ocular blind okay. do develop a theory of mind. Okay? Okay. The children with CVI, yeah. we don't know if they do or they don't. We just don't know. Right. And this is what we're going to test. Uh -huh. But the ocular blind children apparently do develop, without delay, fully functional theory of mind. Okay, that research was just wrong and out of date. <coughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So a majority of CBI children are in mainstream classrooms. What steps or what actions can teachers take in classrooms to support these children? Ah, oh, it's a great question. It's almost like I paid you to ask that. <laughs> I haven't. There are many, many steps, uh, 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 and uh, come along to our CVI course, and that would be uh, uh, one of them. But the first step I would be on, be on anything is to declutter the school environment. Okay, stop having such a cluttered environment. I mean, not only is the environment cluttered, but the work's cluttered, the curriculum is cluttered, uh, the task demands are cluttering. Stop having a big cluttered environment. So the very first thing I would do with that. But before I even get to that stage, I could, so this is about a week-long lecture, okay, is assessing, all right? We have to make sure that we do full 
proper assessments on the individual child. So we understand the thresholds the, that the child is working at. Is the child able to comprehend the speed and speech of the teacher? Is the child able to comprehend two things at once? Or does it have to be done in a linear sequence? Is the child able to access uh, is the child able to access this type of information, either auditory information or visual information, and how should that information be delivered? So there's a whole complex need of assessment that needs to be done. And this is what we focus on on our QTVI programs here at all. So the first step for mainstream teachers is just tear your walls down. Just get them torn down. And then the second step is go along to our CVI course. <laughs> yes, sir. Sure. John, you know um, I've been interested in the case of Ezra Farmerton, uh, me and Kennedy, uh, for a long time there. Um, people don't know that Ezra Farmerton is an artist who's born blind, but he's, he's often blind. Um, and one of the ideas that came from those case studies is that language has an effect on perception. I know I've mentioned this too poor. What do you think of that idea? Thanks, Simon. <laughs> so, the language, uh, there are some uh, language specialists here, aren't there? It's a, it's, I thought Mike was coming. Mike Hall, sorry, I'm Mike, I'm Mike Lynch. So, uh, yes, yeah, so, well, I, I'm going to look at that and say, well, I, I wonder, is it the language or is it the supermodality that's really driving that? So, so I'm going to take the fifth on that, Simon, and, and say, I would need to really look to see if it is the language that's the drive. Now, now, is language comprehensible and drives within that supermodality? I don't know. That, it, that might be it. And I wouldn't imagine it to be so separate to be the case. So I, I would think there's something involved in that. But if it's the sole purpose, the sole driver for it, I, I, yeah, we could debate that. And we will do tonight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, Gordon, oh my God, my nightmare would be saying that. <laughs> from a point of interest, and that is parents, in my experience, who parent using television language, where when you listen to a television and close your eyes, you'll hardly understand anything, do have children with profound difficulties. Mm. But the parents who parent with radio language don't. Indeed. Indeed. I, I think there's no comment back. It's simply an agreement. Yeah. Well, there is agreement. I, I know exactly what Gordon is. Gordon means. So yes, I, I, I totally agree. There you go, Gordon. Yes. Interesting. Right. Right. Yes, Ramsey. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm interested in um, in the context of theory of mind stuff. I, I know that there's a debate in um, discussions about um, empathy um, between people that argue that. Um, Developing a theory of mind of, of someone else having mindness is uh, inferential. It's made by a series of like you know I don't know some sort of deductive steps versus like sort of a more embodied conception where like say something like your facial expressions are immediately mirrored by like mirror neurons in your brain yep. uh, in more of sort of like some sort of uh, perceptual pre cognitive like pre conceptual unity. So I guess I'm wondering like. Do you have a theory on your theory of mind? And does that inform the type of Harvard experiment you'll do? And if, and, if, and if so, what empirical difference would it make in terms of how you set up the experiment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so uh, that's an excellent question. And I think our answer is the proper Psygnosia one. So we're looking at the, the uh, inferential, the second one first, I think, perhaps, because that's an easier experiment to set up and to do. So uh, now we're, we're not absolutely sure if this is the right one, if that's the, how we develop our theory of mind, but that's the one that we're able to test quite easily due to have these different facial exp uh, expressions and different facial uh, control groups that we have. So, so we're testing the second one first. And that's, and that's what this experiment is set up. Now, so is your assumption in that, like, the redu like, that there's a redundancy in the entire sensory information that if one particular mode is removed, there's still sufficient mir mirroring through like... 
But you have to be able to see, you have to be able to see and get those facial expressions for that theory of mind to generate. So those kids with CVI might be able to actually see it. Their acuity might be good enough to see it, but they won't be able to process or under, actually to understand those facial expressions. And that's what we're going to test. Okay. That, one more, does anyone no. <laughs> The first one, uh, 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 I think the answer is yes. So it might well be due to, to the damage in the ventral or the uh, uh, dorsal stream pathways may be leading to that deficit development of the theory of mind and that representations that they have. So, 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 but we don't know, okay? We just don't know. And so this is the theory that we're going to test. We just don't know. In fact, what we might find is that children with CVI might actually have very good uh, 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 theory of mind, but we don't think so. So, but we just don't know. So that's part of the thing that we're going to test. So, to your question, Kerry, thank you very much for that. Uh, is um, so yes, it absolutely is a self-selecting group, uh, uh, and that's possibly one of the issues why NHS Scotland uh, took over this because it was uh, 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 parents themselves were deciding to uh, notify. Uh, their children, and not all children got notified. So it very much was a self-selecting group. Now, it is still much more of a, uh, uh, it's still a select, self-selecting group with Vincent, but this is done a clinic now, okay? And as far as I understand at the moment, we've got around 700 to 800 children notified on the Vincent system. It's, how many, sorry, James? 860 children notified. And, and I'm aware no one has yet been as declined notification. Uh, uh, so, so it's a slightly different group where ours was uh, parents were deciding to uh, uh, to come to. This is done in clinic at clinic environment as part of that clinical process. Put your hands together to thank John for a really stimulating.